Sunday, May 27, 1979. We're at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in Indianapolis, Indiana. We're here for the 63rd edition of The Great Race. The Indianapolis 500. This ABC Sports exclusive is being brought to you by Goodyear, makers of the new wing foot radio, our ultimate handling option. By Toyota. Toyota invites you to see the all-new Celica Supra, the powerful pleasure at your local Toyota dealer. You got it, Toyota. By Campion Spark Plug Company, the Spark Plug Specialist. And by the Coca-Cola Company and the people who bring you delicious, refreshing Coca-Cola. Coke adds life. It's got the taste and the feeling you like. This is one of the most remarkable scenes in all the world of sport. Looking down on the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the day of the great 500-mile automobile race. It started in 1911, and now the crowds here have grown until an estimated 350,000 people are on the premises from across the country, from around the world. In this month of May, ABC Sports has been to the Kentucky Derby, where 130,000 attended in person. We've been to the Preakness, and this very day, another ABC Sports crew is in the streets of Monte Carlo for the Grand Prix. But of all the sights, this one, I think, most stretches the imagination. The temperature here, 61 degrees, the sky's clear, a perfect racing day. This is the same racetrack where Ray Haroon won the first 500 in his Marmon, where Jules Gou drank champagne during pit stops, where the great drivers have won and lost, lived and died. And now, a traditional and always a moving moment here at Indianapolis. This time, it'll be Peter Marshall, a familiar television personality, singing back home in Indiana. Back home again in Indiana and it seems that I can see gleaming candlelight that shines so bright through the sycamores for me. The new moon hay sends all its fragrance through the McKay reporting from Indianapolis. Well, the annual exciting feeling is here. And I'm glad of that because for much of this month, we weren't really sure. In fact, when we first came here early in the month, there was nothing but controversy and litigation. For a while, they weren't really sure that there would actually be a 500-mile race in 1979. Two groups called USAC and CART were fighting and wrestling for control and domination of this kind of motorsport in the United States. Well, they finally reached an armed truce. The cars and the drivers were here, but then there were disqualifications, there were new rules, there were arguments about the new rules, court actions were filed. In fact, as recently as the day before yesterday, some drivers and officials were still testifying in a court in Indianapolis. One of the net results of all this has been the fact that for the first time since 1933, there will be more than 33 cars in the starting field, 35 in fact, Two of them qualified just yesterday morning. One other thing we should be aware of, 
is the fact that they have changed the procedure under the yellow flag. We'll explain the technicalities of it as it occurs in the race. However, once again, the bottom line on that should be much closer racing, quite possibly the closest finish we've ever seen in our years at the Indianapolis 500. Let's bring in right now a man fresh from recent triumphs in the streets of Monte Carlo, Jackie Stewart. Good to have you with us here at Indy, as always. Well, very nice to be here, Jim. Of course, I've been to Monte Carlo, but this is a great race, Jim. And you just said that it's maybe going to be closer this year. I absolutely agree with you. They've reduced the power of these Indianapolis cars this year at Indianapolis, which means that the cars are going to be more evenly matched. Some of the more mediocre cars and drivers are perhaps going to be up there. The other part about it is that by reducing the power, there may be a little more danger and more incident because of it. There's not enough power in hand to get out of trouble if you really need it. And this is going to be important, particularly for the faster drivers. I think we're going to have a very, very exciting 500, and as you said, an extremely close one. Well, you know, I talked about the controversy and the litigation. However, at this moment, I would think that's the last thing in the minds of these drivers. The annual tension is here. I don't believe there's a race that builds more tension than this, because I remember when I raced here, I didn't even want to get out of my garage area and get out to Gasoline Alley. These drivers, what they're going through right now is hard to describe. Even a man of this man's experience, A.J. Foyt, for him to go through that and for a driver of this caliber to stand out in front of 240,000 people who are seated, they're so tense, their stomachs are churning up. Even if you think they're experienced, when they slip these gloves on, I bet there's a few wet palms there. I know I felt it. I know every racing driver says that he stays cool, but my goodness, can he? The amount of control you need at this time, the mental control, is beyond most sports understanding. You've normally got a team to back you up. Right now, you've got a whole lot of horsepower behind you. You've got an enormous crowd looking at you, and one of the most demanding events in the year to look forward to. And when it's done, only one driver will win. The annual question, Jackie, who's it going to be this time? Well, this year, being a canny Scott, since there are 35 cars One in the of the field, canniest. <laughs> I'm going to take two. Oh, you're going to take I'd two? I'd like to take Go two. Ahead. Because I would love young Rick Mears to win. He's such a talented driver. He's so exciting for the public, so young. And he really should win the race. He can win the race, and I'd like him to do it. But at the same time, I recognize the experience of a man like Jim Hall, who builds the car for Alan, so who's won it before three times. That combination could be extraordinary. So I'm being the canny Scott, and I'm taking two. What about you, James? We Yanks always go right out on the limb. I'll take brother Bobby Unser to win the race. By the way, when they take the green flag from starter Pat Bedan, driving the official pace car will be this man. Jackie, good luck to you on that. Well, I'm In fact, you better get down there. I've got to go down there right now. Very privileged to drive the pace car. Maybe the first partner who's ever done it, and I'm looking forward to it. Right, Jackie. Well, in one minute, Mrs. Mary Hallman will utter the most famous call to the post in motor racing. And now race fast. We continue our same-day coverage of the Indianapolis the 500. It's time now for... The words that are so familiar here were years uttered by owner Tony Holman, now by his widow, Mrs. Mary Holman. Let's go down to trackside now. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. The chairman of the board of directors, Mrs. Tony Holman, uttering the words, used to be simply gentlemen, start your engines. Now, of course, it's lady and gentlemen, start your engines in honor of Janet Guthrie, the only woman in the field, the only, only woman who has ever raced here. Look at A.J. Foyt at age 45, out after his fifth Indianapolis win. No self-starters in these cars, of course. They are artificially started from the rear. There's Tom Sneva. Twice he sat on the pole, but he's never won it. Bobby Unser, 45 years old, now looking for his third victory. Oh, a brother of last year's winner, Gordy Johncock. He's won once, but it was a rain short and race. He'd like to win again. Jackie talked about the tension. I should think right now another emotion is felt in here. There is Janet, the woman in the race. Another emotion might be loneliness because all the company that Danny Ungaius there who's starting way back in the ninth row, he had a crash in practice and had to qualify on a later day. All of these people, as I say, have had company out there, company that wasn't too welcome at times for the last hour or so, but now they must feel lonely, I think. All by themselves, 33 of them, the centers of all these pairs of eyes, 350,000 strong. Here's how the first two rows light up for today's Indy 500. In only his second start here, 27-year-old Rick Mears of Bakersfield, California, sits on the pole, fastest qualifier at a speed of 193.736. Mears is in a Cosworth-powered machine of the Roger Penske Racing Team. Car number nine, Mears. Tom Sneva of Spokane, Washington, will be in car number one, middle of the first row. 
He's the current USAC national champion, won the pole here in 1977 and 78. But Sneva, fired by Penske last fall, still wears the bridesmaid tag at Indy, finishing second the past two years. On the outside, the defending champion, three-time winner Al Unser. Only A.J. Foyt has won the 500 more often than the driver of car number two, the younger of the two famous racing Unsers of New Mexico. It's an innovative car of the Jim Hall team, Al Unser in car number two. Now for a look at the second row, and on the inside, there's Bobby Unser, the older brother of Al. Well into his 40s now, Bobby has won the race twice in 1968 and 1975. He drives for the Penske team, a new affiliation for him. His car is number 12, and he'll be right behind the pole sitter and his teammate, Mears, when they take the green flag. In the middle will be car number three. That's Gordy Johncock, who won the disaster-ridden, rain-shortened race here in 1973. Gordon has finished in the top five at Indy on six different occasions. Last year, he was third. He's now 42 years old. On the outside of row two, the familiar face of A.J. Foyt. In car number 14, A.J. seeks his fifth win in the great race. There's something new, though. Rather than a car of his own design, he drives a car called a Parnelli, named after his old racing rival of the 60s, Parnelli Jones. A.J., number 14. And now let's spot two other drivers of special interest. Janet Guthrie is the only woman ever to have driven in the Indianapolis 500. She was 29th two years ago, a creditable ninth last year. This time, in car number 45, she'll start in the middle of row five, alongside her teammate, Howdy Holmes, the only rookie in this year's race. Janet Guthrie, car number 45. And then, there's Danny Ungaius, one of the fastest men in racing, who crashed in practice, finally had to qualify on the third day. For that reason, he'll be starting way back on the outside of the ninth row in car number 25. He'll be in heavy traffic at the start. Danny Ungaius. Some of the significant starters, then, in the 1979 Indianapolis 500. We'll be back in a minute with the start of the race. The cars are preparing for the start of the 1979 Indianapolis 500 Mile Classic. Driving the pace car this year, and this is no ceremonial task only, it's a very important task, is my colleague in these telecasts, Jackie Stewart, three-time world champion, veteran of the Indianapolis 500 himself. In his car is a Camry. You're looking from that camera right now back at the other two cars, which are ceremonial pace cars, but behind them, the entire field. By the way, one car, car number 23, Jim McElreath, was late in starting, but it is on the racetrack now. Let's go down to Jackie Stewart driving the pace car. Jackie? This is Jackie Stewart in the pace car. We're now between turn one and turn two here. We're doing 50 miles an hour right in the bottom, right in the center of the racetrack. The two Mustangs. Other pace cars behind me here, and then, of course, the 35 cars lining up. I'm just in turn two now, looking up at the new VIP suites. An enormous crowd down here. What an impression this is. To go down this long 3,300-foot backstretch, you see it shimmering here with the heat. Ideal racing conditions. It almost disappears at the end of the here because you see it almost turn three almost disappearing ahead of you here and this packed grandstand ahead of us also tremendous feeling of occasion here that's a big thrill for me I, I hope you can hear it in my voice because it's almost emotional it's a strange feeling to be sitting here in the quietness out here in a racetrack where normally as a racing driver i've been of course listening to the enormous noise behind me of race cars and of course of my own engine Great feeling. Now we're going in to turn three. An enormous crowd high in the bleachers here, all waving, waving their arms to me, waving their arms to the drivers, obviously wishing everybody luck and most of all a safe, safe race. We're now in turn three, still doing 50 miles an hour. Joe Clotier, president of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, on my right hand side, standing high on the racetrack, on the race car here, on my pace car, looking over the entire field. Joe Frittier, listening to Chief Stewart up in the control there, Tom Binford, he's talking to him, seeing if the field is being formed correctly and to his satisfaction. Now we're in turn four, and now I look down the most sensational sight of all, looking down this front street, again 3,300 feet, but my goodness, there's so many people 
they've just thrown in on either side is a mass of color, a mass of faces. I don't think I've ever seen so many people. I've done it myself, I've been in the field, but to see it like this is totally different. What an amazing sight. We're now getting up to a little bit faster. We're getting up to 60 miles an hour. We're now at the start finishing line. All right, Jackie, thank you very much. Jackie Stewart very much tending to business now in the pace car as they move on what should be the final lap before they get the green flag. Moving into turn one, let's set the field. On the pole, remember, is young Rick Mears in car number nine. In the middle, car number one is Tom Steve. On the outside, the other yellow car, number two, Al Unser. On the second row, number 12, Bobby Unser. In the middle, three, Gordon Johncock. And on the outside, 14, A.J. Foyt. There's that second row just coming into view. Foyt in the orange car on the outside. The third row, number six, Wally Dallenbach on the inside. In the middle, number four, Johnny Rutherford. On the outside, number 15, Johnny Parsons, whose father won this race long ago. In the next row, row four on the inside, number 24, Sheldon Kinzer, 89, Lee Kunzman, 36, Mike Mosley. Row five, 46 is rookie Howdy Holmes, the only rookie in the race. Number 45, Janet Guthrie, the only woman in the race. Number 11, Tom Bagley. Row six, number 77, the well-remembered Salt Walther. In the middle, number 10, Pancho Carter of a racing family. Number 29, the Canadian Cliff Husel. In row seven, number 23, Jim McElreath is not on the racetrack. His car would not start. They got it started. It went out, took part of one lap, and came back in again. In the middle, number 17, Dick Simon. Number 73 on the outside, Jerry Sneva, brother of Tom. In row eight, number 34, the Australian Vern Chupan. 31, Larry Rice. 80, Larry Dixon. Row nine. The veteran Roger McCluskey, number 72, Joe Saldana, number 69, and very important, Danny Ungaya starting way back there in car number 25. In the next row, number 7 is Steve Krisilov, 97, Phil Treshy, 44, Tom Bigelow, Spike Gelhazen, John Mailer, and Eldon Rasmussen in the next row, and finally, the two cars that qualified just yesterday morning, number 22, Billy Vukovic, number 59, George Snyder. Looks like we're ready for the start. Pat Fadan does not have the flag out yet as they come out of turn four. Jackie has pulled off, however, in the pace car. That is the signal that we should have a start. Now, number 23, McElreath is back on the track again. They're racing at Indianapolis, going side by side into the first turn. On the outside, Al Unser started to make a move, but didn't. On the inside is Tom Steve, but Unser ducks down and takes the lead. The man who won the race last year is in first place just that quickly. Tom Steve is second, and pole sitter Rick Mears is third. It looks like A.J. Point very quickly has moved into fourth position, and there he is. Al Unser then, the yellow car in the lead. The next yellow car is car number one, Tom Steve. There's the man who won the race last year. Many people think he can do it again in a beautifully newly designed car of Jim Hall. The rest of the field of 35 cars strung out behind. As we said, McElreath with the only problem is whether you start the race. He is on the racetrack at the moment. So apparently we have a good, clean start for everybody. The first time the crowd here has seen them racing. How many people? We don't know. We'll know later on. So, somewhere between 300 and 400,000. Remember, racing conditions are perfect. It's clear and cool and crisp. Perfect for the engines. Al Unser already begin getting to put some distance between him and the race of the car. A sensational start by Unser. And now we have Rick Mears moving into second ahead of Tom Steva. Steva dropping back to third. But look at the way Al Unser is pouring it on just on the second lap. And now for fourth place, look at the blue and white car. That is Gordon Johncock, who has moved ahead of A.J. Foyt for fourth place. There, Johncock in the blue and white, then Foyt. Al Unser has won this race three times, going after his fourth Indianapolis 500 win. If he would do it, would tie A.J. Foyt. Back into the pitch yet again, Jim McElreath, somewhat ironically, in the car that was driven here last year by Mario Andretti, so the car is now missing, and Mario is missing, of course, as world champion. He was required to participate in the Grand Prix of Monaco today. The racing answers of New Mexico. What a great story they are. There were more than two originally. One brother died on this racetrack in practice many years ago. Their Uncle Louie kept racing up in the Pikes Peak Hill Climb until finally they had to put a rule in. Uncle Louie was about 67 years old and still going strong. They thought it might be dangerous, so they put in a rule, I believe, that you couldn't drive over 60. Well, Bobby Unser is well over 60, somewhere up near 200 right now, miles per hour, that is. And he is still just really moving out from his field. There's Rick Beard in second place. Tom Steva is third. Gordon John coming at you. And now A.J. Foyt has dropped back to fifth behind Johnny Rutherford. Johnny Rutherford in car number four, another two-time winner of the race, has moved into contention. Well, there's such a long, long way to go, but this has the sign 
of something that could develop into a beautiful Indianapolis 500. Al Unser in the loneliest place in the racetrack right now. That's the backstretch. But when you move into turn three, there's a huge grandstand there. Remember, seats for some 250,000 people. Everybody else standing. And the crowd of, as I said, somewhere between 300 and 400,000 people. And there is Howdy Holmes coming into the pits. This is a rookie in his very first Indianapolis 500 in car number 46. He's the teammate of Janet Guthrie. This is a very much unscheduled pit stop for Howdy Holmes as he pulls in. Much too early for anybody to be coming in for fuel, obviously, in this race. Al Hunter just continuing to move out from the rest of the field. I said this is a beautifully designed car. It's also a differently designed car. It is supposed to hug the track a little more snugly because of something called ground effect. It is the lineal descendant, in a way, of the so-called vacuum cleaner car that Jim Hall designed some years ago, which actually used a motor to suck air from the track. This one does it simply by a natural vacuum. Okay, there again we have Gordon Johncock, followed closely by Johnny Rutherford. A lot of veterans up front. There is the leader, Al Unser. Behind him, Tom Stevens, car number one. Excuse me, and Rick Mears in car number nine. In third place is Tom Steven in car number one. Then we have Gordon Johncock, Johnny Rutherford, and A.J. Foyt. Janet Guthrie into the pits. Both of the cars on that team first into the pits. Another unscheduled pit stop. The green flag is still out, but we'll be back in a minute at the Indianapolis 500. We're back again at Indianapolis. This is Jim McKay, and with me now in the booth is Jackie Stewart, back from his duties as pace car driver. The leader in the race is still Al Unser, then Rick Mears, Tom Sneva, Gordon Johncock, and Johnny Rutherford. Down in the pits today, we have Bill Fleming and Chris Akatamaki and Dave Diles are doing special periodic reports for us. Will be my longtime ABC colleague, Chris Schenkel. There is Janet Guthrie, the only woman in the race, being pushed out. It looks like it's over. She's not even getting out the race car. What a disappointed lady that must be. She doesn't even want to face the people here. It's so sad because all month long she's been anticipating so much driving this car that she feels happy with, and suddenly it's let her down. She is not, however, the first car out of the race. That went to Jim McElreath, his car number 23. They had trouble starting it, remember. He finally got out on the race course, but didn't even last one lap. And there goes Janet Guthrie in the very early going out of the race being pushed to the garage area. She was the first woman ever to drive here each year. We pointed out earlier she's done a little better. Last year she was in ninth place, drove extremely well, and certainly has developed a lot of respect from the men in the year she's been here. Certainly has, really going well. There's another young man going very well, Rick Mears. My goodness, is he talented. Someday he's going to cross the world motor racing. I prophesy right now that he'll be in Grand Prix motor racing sometime in the future. Just when, I don't know, but right now he's a busy young man and he's really having a go. Rick Mears at the moment in second place. In third place in the race is Tom Sneva, whom Rick Mears replaced on the Roger Penske team. And in fourth place, we have John Cock. That's a slower car he's passing. The leader's already beginning to lap the back markers in this field. Tom Sneva in third place, though, in car number one. Tom Sneva, very smooth driver, very clever man intellectual an old school teacher certainly has little time today to teach school but he certainly is still a smooth driver there we see gordon johncock the blue and white car he is in fourth place aj Foyt is fifth and there is aj you saw him briefly in the orange car fleeing past gordon johncock won this race a tragic race in 1973 remember that was when salt walter crashed when sweet savage crashed and later died rain ended the race at about 300 miles but johncock was the winner and he's got that in his bonnet. He'd like to win a full-length Indy 500. You can be sure of that. Gordon John Cock, got George Bignotti mechanicing for him. He mechanic for me and for John Meekham when I came to the Speedway in 66 and 67. And really a great mechanic. There's A.J. Foyt driving his Coyote Orange, number 14, the Gilmer Foyt car. My goodness, he's quick. And, of course, Parnelli Jones's name stuck on that car. I was going to say, the Coyote this year is actually a Parnelli. Uh, it is indeed. Parnelli it's still Jones Stable. It's still Coyote Orange, A.J. says. <laughs> no question of that. A.J. Foyt looking for his fifth Indianapolis 500 win, of course. The only man ever to have won it four times. Into the pits, Jerry Sneva in car number 73. He is the brother of Tom. And uh, what do you think might be the problem there? Looks like it's all over for sure. It doesn't look good. That's a major problem, Jim. That's the turbo that's blowing back there. I should think the engine's out. A yellow flag is out. And, of course, pit stops will be critical in this race, as in all races. 
How does it work down there? Well, let's have a little demonstration of that right now with Jackie. And days gone by, the pace of pit stops in the Indianapolis 500 were, by today's standards, a little more leisurely. But still, the work had to be done. We're going to demonstrate, however, with Rick Mears and the ever-efficient Roger Penske crew, what happens today. Five men are allowed over the wall. The car will stop seven or eight times for fuel during the race. And these stops, for every second of a stop, it means the length of a football field. So every one of those mechanics have to work efficiently. Now we're going to circle what each man has to do, the purpose of his work during a pit stop. That man circled there is the fuel man. The fuel tank is behind. And as the car comes in, he plugs in that fuel line. It's alcohol that he's feeding into the car, 30 or 40 gallons of it. This man, he's changing the rear right wheel. Again, an air tool. He has got an air jack. He plugs that in, and from underneath the car, a relatively new thing to motor racing, four little jacks come out and lift the car up. Getting away from the risk of a car falling off a jack as used to happen from time to time. This man with the protection on his head, he looks after the overflow. Any alcohol that comes out there in excess of what is needed goes into a little reservoir and he takes care of that. The man circled in the front of the car is changing the right front wheel. Again, an air tool is used. That wheel comes off and he plugs on another wheel with a nut already attached to take away the risk of barbing the thread or losing the nut. The car goes down and they push it away. Each stop takes around 13 or 14 seconds to happen if he only needs fuel, but if he changes his tires as well, it's around an 18 to 20 second pit stop. It's synchronized efficiency, choreography, total understanding, the high risk for these mechanics if any work is carelessly done. Enormously good men, tremendously important for the driver, a chorus line that has to be in step. And that's how a modern pit stop works in Indianapolis. There's the leader in this year's race, the man who won it last year, Al Unser, in car number two, coming into the pits. At age 39, Unser of Albuquerque, New Mexico, looking for a second victory in a row. He did that before, back in 1970 and 71. He's one of only four men who have won this race two years running, and he'd like to do that trick twice. If he wins today, we will have done it. There's a good look at Al up in the corner not changing any rubber he went out in 12.4 seconds no rubber change at this point he's accelerating away important at this stage for a racing driver not to miss any gears he goes from first to second to third and then into fourth he has to stay below the double yellow line there as he goes through and there's rick mears he's in the pits and also being pushed away wasn't in the pits very long though a very good pit stop by the roger penske crew you saw them on the demonstration. This is the 27-year-old man from Bakersfield, California, who sat on the pole when this race began. In now comes Danny Ungayas. Remember, he crashed on the first day, uh, what was supposed to be the first day of qualifying, in practice, so he had to qualify later on, started way back in the ninth row, but he's really been moving up. Certainly has. This is a question of a man who really charges. He always charges. He's one of the fastest drivers in racing today. A 13.1 second stop with only fuel. And obviously, th these are very much the first First scheduled pit stop for these cars in the Indianapolis 500. Danny Ungaius in the black car number 25. We're operating under the yellow flag here for the first time today, and that is a new system uh, to Indianapolis. It's been used in most other forms of racing in the United States, where they all bunch up behind the pace car rather than using the old pacer lights they used to have here. Certainly famous from the NASCAR Southern Stock Car Trail where the, that pace car comes out. And by the way, Jim, that's not exactly the same pace car as I drove to pace the race. They've got another one with lights on the top so the drivers can plainly see it. It Driven certainly makes closer motor racing. It doesn't, however, do the leader much good if he stretches his lead. That means that everyone can close up behind him and compact the field. So when he gets his foot on the gas at the end of that yellow light system, all the advantage that he had built up has been disappeared. Whereas under the old pacer light system, they had to maintain the supposed interval between them. We'll be right back at Indianapolis. Well, there you see the kind of disappointment that comes after all the long preparation and practice for an Indianapolis 500 and then an early breakdown. It's Janet Guthrie. Guthrie Dave? Quite some time ago that she wasn't here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway just out of a gimmick. Janet, this is a year that you had good equipment. You thought you could win it. Everything went extremely well at the start of the race. But the motor went away. You hadn't had a whole lot of time with this engine. You'd had some trouble with another engine before, had you not, Janet? This is a fresh engine. It had not been run before. We lost one carburation day. This is a new one. How long was it into the race until you knew you had some problems? About three laps before I parked it. 
Janet, I know you're extremely disappointed, but knowing you, I know you'll be back here next year at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I certainly hope so. Janet Guthrie, out early in this year's Indy 500. Janet Guthrie almost appearing to be stunned by her early exit from the race. She's out of it, though, for 1979, and now the green flag out. They're racing again in the Indianapolis 500. Pat Vidan, the veteran starter. This may be his last season here, they say, Jackie, but he's done a good job for a good, long, long time. Great character here, part of the scene of the Indianapolis 500, but there you go. We've got a clock running in the bottom right-hand side around this two-and-a-half-mile oval. Great big speedway. Alan, so the clock is running on because he's the man that's setting the pace here. He seems to be able to drive on any part of this racetrack. And there's a famous man. Certainly is. Former President Gerald Ford, high in the cupola here at Indianapolis. He has a good view of everything. The unofficial clock, that is very much an unofficial clock, we're doing, but it'll give you a very good idea of the kind of speed he's turning in. Remember, the speeds are down from what they used to be before because they've turned down the boost, as they call it, in these turbochargers. But they're much higher than people thought they might be under the new rules. The top qualifying speed of Rick Mears was over 193 miles per hour. That, of course, is not a racing speed. A standby now as he comes to the start-finish line. They tell him 84-4. Let's see what we get. We get 57-1, and 57-1 works out to... Whoa. This particular chart doesn't go down that far. That goes to 176.12 miles an hour. That was a very slow lap for yeah. him. The previous lap had been up much faster, 184 miles an hour. But, of course, when you're in traffic and when the pace of the race is just starting, the engine and the driver, everybody's not fired up quite to the usual standard. So that was a slow lap for Al Anson. Okay, Rick Mears is currently second in the race. As we said, he's just 27 years old, driving in only his second Indianapolis 500. Last year, he was named co-rookie of the year. But this year, he wants a lot more than that, having won the pole position. Right behind him is Tom Steva. Interesting, because Tom Steva drove for Roger Penske last year, was released at the end of the season, and Rick My Mears was hired in his place. Uh, and there's smoke. a problem, a oh. real problem there. Sheldon Kinsler, he blew an engine, and my goodness, that could have been a problem for both Rick Mears and Tom Steva, because the way that happened, both of those cars could have collided. They had to go right around that other car there. Obviously, nothing that Sheldon Kinsler could have done. When an engine blows, the driver just can't do anything about it. He has to try and move out of the way. Sometimes the oil can splatter over the rear wheels, and that could have been a problem, but certainly those drivers got round it. Okay, and so Mears and Sneva still contend for second and third place in the race. They are well behind the leader, remember, who is Alancer in car number two. He is in their sight, but not in ours at the moment. Several hundred yards in front, of course. That's a flash of a second if anything goes wrong in the Indianapolis 500 at these racing speeds. In traffic now, Al Unser, the leader, car number two. He said he's 39 years old, comes from Albuquerque, New Mexico, the father of three. Let's meet him up close and personal. As you can see, racing has been good to me. I have a very nice home. There isn't anything that I have or that I can't have. Uh, if I want something, I can, some way or another, figure out how to get it. So racing's been very, very good to me. With my son coming into racing, if that's what he wants to do, uh, I'm all for it. I'll help him in every way I can. But he has to totally want to do it himself, not because of what his uncle and, and myself have done. He can't look at it that way. He has to look at it in the aspect that, as an individual, he's going to have to make his own ground, and he's going to have to be able to go race and do the job as an individual. I went through the same thing with my brothers. They were older than I was, and when I was starting in racing, I automatically thought, well, if they can do it, I can do it. Well, it doesn't work out like that because we're different people. See what he did to me, right there? Knocked me clean off the track. Well, you should know better than that. My sister and I both live across town. We're living on our own. When my dad does come in town, um, we come over and visit him, because uh, he does want to see us. And uh, we watch TV with him. We 
we go out in the dune buggies with them, go have fun. I like to watch over those two. They get into trouble a lot, and I get blamed for a lot of things. But um, it's all right. I got a divorce that was back in, uh, I believe, 1971 or 72. Being divorced becomes a very hard thing with your kids with your family because it becomes a, a, a battling point between the mother and the father as far as children go. And uh, I think my kids have done very, very well. Uh, there was a period there that uh, went along of five years or so that, that uh, become a very bore in my life. And, and uh, Karen came along and uh, kind of put the whole package together. And in this business, it, it you need somebody like that. She has really fulfilled everything that I wanted. <laughs> well, I think it is exciting to have my husband as a race car driver and in the limelight all the time. It's exciting to have everybody else admire him the way they do, and I can look at him and say, you know, he belongs to me. He's mine. A visit with Al Unser, currently leading the 1979 Indianapolis 500 in the yellow car number two. A good close look at the car now. You've met the man. So, we're still in the early going here. Before this crowd, oh, a wheel loose on the racetrack. Let's see who lost that. It looks like it was Wally Dallenbeck, perhaps in car number six. That, that could really be dangerous, Jim, because another car could run into that wheel. The wheel's slowly getting into the ground. That's a bit of luck, and there's the rescue vehicle. Yeah, there he is. There's and, Wally. And the car is literally running on, on two wheels, Jim. It's all jacked up, and it's really rubbing that suspension away. The left front wheel's right off the ground because the weight of the car and the balance is wrong. But I'm afraid that suspension system, he's driving it back. Wally Dollenbach's a very experienced driver. He knows what he's doing. He's got the car under control. But I'm afraid this is, it must be the end of the race for Wally because I'm sure the damage that's been done by this, the tremendous friction, you can see it scoring the racetrack. It's cutting into the tarmac there. What it must be doing to the car, Jim. A great disappointment, particularly for Wally Dallenbach at age 42. He's never won this race, although he's been one of the top drivers in the country for a good many years. The last three years, he finished fourth, fourth, and fifth, and hoped to move up this year. But uh, very doubtful they could ever repair that, isn't it? Uh, well, that, he's just been in. He was into the pit stop there, and I'm afraid there may be a problem there that they didn't put that wheel on properly. I'm afraid somebody's going to be very embarrassed, very sad, and maybe very angry. Certainly Wally Dallenbach. What a dignified man he is for the sport. And so the yellow flag is out. So it appears as Wally Dallenbach. In a minute, we'll be back with Chris Schenkel. And as we continue with our same-day coverage of the Indy 500, Al Unser has led 61 laps. Rick Mears has led three, A.J. Foyt one. Al Unser's average time, 159.7. 26 cars are still running on this beautiful day. Nine cars have dropped out and let's summarize. As we look at the numerals on the right, that is the lap on which the leader is racing. You see Jerry Sneva, Jim McElreath, credited with no laps, spending all the time in the pits. Cliff Husel, the only Canadian in the field. You see the reasons for why they dropped out of the race. An unfortunate, in his 13th start, Wally Dallenbach lost that wheel which you just saw. Let's go back to the action now. And here is Jim McKay and Jackie Stewart. All right, Chris. Thank you very much, Chris Schenkel. There is Johnny Rutherford in car number four and Bobby Unser in car number 12. Currently battling right now for second place in the race behind Al Unser. There you saw the interval. The leader just went out the bottom of the screen. And now among these other cars here, we will pick out car number four on the left, car number 12 just behind him, the red, white, and blue car of Bobby Unser. Rutherford and Unser, each of whom has won this race twice. That's Bobby Unser, of course. Al is leading the race. Each have won it twice, looking for their third victory here. Al being given the signal that he is seven seconds ahead of the second place battle. A tremendous margin, and there you see Jim Hall, the man who owns the Al Unser car, tremendously clever man, and that car that he has been able to construct, it can almost drive in any part of the racetrack. This chassis is so good, I just I can't imagine how superior it is to the rest of them, and you can see what a lead he has. As he comes down that long back straight, he has a big, big lead until you get this group involving this man here, Johnny Rutherford, one of the best drivers in American motor racing. Very cool, very calm and collected. The McLaren team, been a successful team in Indianapolis over the years. Bobby Unser, a man that's fulfilling the complete mirror vision 
for Johnny Rutherford right now. Remember, these cars have rear view mirrors, and Johnny Rutherford's getting his filled right now because Bobby Ants is trying to get past in the front stretch. Does he get it as he crosses the finishing line? They're going into turn one head to head, and he does it. Bobby Ants is getting past. What a move. And look, look, Rutherford's high on the racetrack. He made an error there. He didn't think. And well, that's Danny Ungaius, excuse me, Danny Ungaius getting in between the two in that black car, number 25, Ungaius, who started way back in the ninth row and continues to work his way up through the field and to pick up laps on some of the leading cars now, getting on the same lap with him. He's still not on the same lap with the leader. In between the two cars of Rutherford and Bobby Unser. Bobby Unser, who won this race in 1968 and again in 1975. This year with a brand new team for him, remember, that being the team of Roger Penske. So it's Rick Mears and Bobby Unser for the Penske team. Well, all I can see is that Johnny Rutherford there, and look at this man there, up to fourth position, A.J. Foyt, never very far away from anything. A.J., a canny operator, tremendously talented driver, one of the most talented men, and here we come into the pitch, our leader, Al Unser, into the pits. Okay, this should be a scheduled pit stop. Once again, does not look like a problem as far as we can see. The car number two, all the uniforms, color key to the car Bobby operation, things much fancier, much more marketable, you might say, in this modern day of racing. And again, no tire change. This means that this chassis is running well for Lyle Unser. 12.8 seconds, a good pit stop. When they don't change rubber, this means that the car is running very well. All the rubber is on the road. These big, wide racing tires spread nicely across the racetrack. And look at this. Look at this. Is that good racing? Place. Four abreast, that other car behind here looking for a way to get through. They're all going into turn one, carving each other up. Very dicey racing, and that was Bobby Unser that was stuck out behind there. Really, there was no racetrack left. It's 50 feet wide, and there were four abreast. Whew. Really was. This is not that wide a racetrack, as you pointed out, either on the straightaway or in these corners, with those ominous walls facing you all the time. That Indianapolis wall, and there's Bobby Unser getting up alongside there, and he's getting through. Bobby Unser gets through one of the slower cars there as he commits himself. Very clean and very narrow line around this Indianapolis motor speedway. You've got to be on that black groove all the time. Just a few minutes ago there, Johnny Rutherford got out of that black groove, and Danny on guys got under him, and of course, that's exactly what can happen. But it's really close racing, very tight, and there, the Unser Calling Bobby in. Bobby's going to come into the pits, pit signals out to them, although they have two-way radios, still the conventional pit signal is given just to be sure the driver understands that there's no electronic interference. Okay, Bobby Unser, the elder, remember, the two racing Unser brothers, he's 45 years old. And there is a look at him in the upper left-hand corner of your screen. A racing family from way back, their dad raced. We talked about their uncle and their brother who unfortunately died on this racetrack. A tough there. man, a hard man. Really, when you look at Bobby Unser, you look at a man that you know is tough. He looks that way, he drives that way. He's a man that gives very little. He's a very nice man, he lifts his hand. That hand going up there, the gloved hand to tell the car behind them, that shows you a bit of experience there. He raised that right on uh, hand high above the rear aerofoil or rear wing so the car behind him could see he was going to pull late off the racetrack to get into the pit he stops locks one wheel up there the penske pit go into action and of course while brother al Unser was in the pits very briefly bobby went into the lead but now al retakes the lead out on the racetrack as bobby gets the very quick pit stop 12.7 seconds unofficial that crew is fast the thing is, you've got to get into the pit lane and you've got to get out fast and Rick Mears comes in now, staying left, as we see of our picture now, away from that yellow line, now he comes into his pit. Now he's got to come in at such a speed that there's no risk of him overshooting because if he does that, there's a great risk that he would have to be pushed back and therefore lose valuable time. And remember, as we said, one second in the pits is equal to the length of a football field. That's a long way. You've got to be quick. It's also a long way from the open road racing where Rick Mears started. Much more to come.
We return to our same day coverage of the 1979 Indianapolis 500. Jim McKay here with Jackie Stewart. The leader in the race is still car number two, Al Unser. Then as you see, you have his brother Bobby behind him in second place. Then Johnny Rutherford, A.J. Foyt, Rick Mears is in fifth place now, and Tom Sneva in sixth. All six of those cars still in the same lap. One lap down, but all the way up into seventh place now is Danny Ungayas, remember, who started all the way back in 27th. He could be a factor before this race is over. Danny Ungayas, while he's on the racetrack, is always a factor. But for these men up top, it's amazing to me that you see two brothers leading a motor race of this importance. The biggest motor race in the world, and here you have Al Unser and Bobby Unser leading the race. Isn't that amazing? What a family can produce. That all yellow car streaking around here not too close to the wall as he went out there. Okay, Al, Recker, uh, Al Unser has now set a new record for 200 miles in the race, 164 miles an hour plus. Down in the pits now to Chrissy Konamaki. Jim, who's setting the pace, you or is Al driving his own race? He's just driving his own race. I think he's comfortable. We're, we got plenty of fuel. We're running the low boost. I think the car will run all day that long. Uh, we're just letting him drive it. You, you, you haven't changed tires, or you're getting great tire wear. I see everybody else is changing a lot of rubber, and you're not. Is this the chassis design? Uh, no, it's been pretty easy on the tires. It looks like we're going to have to make a change. What about uh, the pace? Do uh, you have any more left in the car, Al? Uh, Jim. Uh, my communication with Al's not working too good. I assume he's got a little left. I'm not sure. No trouble talking back and forth? Yeah, I, I'm having a little radio trouble. Okay, that's the first indication of any trouble in this pit. Communications back and forth between car owner and chief mechanic Jim Hall and the leading driver Al Unser going for victory number four in the Indianapolis 500. Car owner Jim Hall, a wealthy Texas oil man, used to drive cars himself and design some radically different race cars in the 1960s. There is Marsha Unser, by the way, Bobby's wife, and behind him, Kathy Penske, the wife of team owner and captain, Roger Penske. Again, that look, that head-on shot, that's a beautiful shot. Danny and Gaius tucked in behind there, behind Ooh. Bobby, whoop. Oh, it looked like he almost got hit there. He really yeah. had to move out of his groove very quickly. You've got to remember that these racing cars are very sensitive. And if you have to move very abruptly at the sort of speeds involved here, suddenly that car can go into the wildest spin you've ever seen. Danny and Guy is right there. Had to be very, very sensitive with the way he worked that steering wheel to get the car away from the car that he almost collided with. And if the wheels ever even touch each other, it's almost certain disaster, right? Well, it's all right if you kiss wheels side by side, even then you never want to do that, but if they interlock, they go like two gears and the car just gets thrown into the air. Danny on Gaius right there. Well, Danny on Gaius, who has now unleft himself from the second place car, if he could pass Al Unser, and that'll be no easy task, he could then be on the same lap with all of the leaders. But he's on the same lap with all of the leaders except the first place car of Al. 86, 186.3 they're giving him for his speed. Very fast. Position seven and he's going to be coming into the pits pretty soon. And here you've got Johnny Rutherford in there. And then you've got Tom Sneaver behind there. Johnny Rutherford being worked out. They're taking the wing off of Johnny oh, Rutherford's major car. Major problems. Major problems for Johnny Rutherford, two-time winner of the Indy 500. Seemed to happen very suddenly. He didn't seem to be slowing down on the race course. Was in third place in the race, in fact. And he's staying in the car, Jim. It's peculiar he's staying in the car, so they intend to fix it. There's a great activity there behind them. Tom Sneaver and that number Number one car pulling out of the pits as the McLaren crew there, led by a great man to, who's been mechanicking in Formula One, Alexander, Tyler Alexander, and that mechanic crew there, very experienced. They're working in the gearbox. They've got, they're draining the oil from the gearbox. They're taking the gearbox to bits. Largely a colonial crew here, Australians and New Zealanders. They've even got a few Americans in there. Led by an American, I might add, Tyler Alexander. He is indeed. Okay, into the pits now comes the race leader. Here is Al Unser. Yellow flag is out now. No major accident. It was because of uh, some oil on the track, apparently. No, it was a tow-in. One car was towed in, so it's nothing to worry about. There's not been any action, but the yellow flag is out. And changing the wheels now in the Jim Hall car, the man, the chaparral man from success in sports cars, from success in all kinds of motor racing. He's won the Can-Am, and he's won the Indy thing, and my goodness, he's going hard this time. Okay, Johnny Rutherford sitting in the car. What does he see inside that cockpit? Let's learn with Jackie. 
I'm sitting in Johnny Rutherford backup McLaren Cosworth. It may look a little cramped and uncomfortable, but not so. First of all, let's think of the seat. It's tailor-made, molded to the driver's body in a fiberglass mold. In fact, very comfortable. Of course, the driver wears seat belts, just as we wear them on the highway. A race driver certainly wears them in a race car. In this case, a six-point fastening. They're a little special, however. Two straps come between the driver's legs to stop him from slipping under his seat belts or submarining in the case of a head-on accident. He's got a lap strap and then, of course, a shoulder harness as well. The steering wheel looks very small, and of course it is. Because of the cramped area within the cockpit, the steering wheel is smaller than you would see in a road car. The switch on the right-hand side of the steering wheel is the main electric switch, the kill switch, as they call it. Up for on, down for off. That button there is to work the two-way radio, so the driver can press the button and speak to his crew chief. He's got a headset, which is built in to his crash helmet, and there is the volume control there for that headset to give him good communication. A lot of noise in a racing car. The steering wheel, as I say, is different in more ways than one. In fact, this steering wheel comes off. In the case of an accident, of course, it would allow the emergency crews to get in quickly, and of course, ease of entry also. The dashboard has a few gauges. That gauge there is the rev counter, the engine speed, around 9,400 to 9,800 revs per minute when the engine is flying down these long straights. This is the water temperature gauge. It would run around 80 degrees centigrade when the engine is running in the race. On the right-hand side of that is the oil pressure and temperature gauge, around 80 pounds per square inch, or in the oil temperature, it would get up to 90 degrees. This here is for the turbo boost, for the turbocharger, and there, 50 inches of power is allowed there. The driver can control that 50 inches. He can reduce it by that boost control switch down to perhaps affect better economy. It's got a gearbox, these racing cars, just like we have on the street car. This one is a four or five speed gearbox. The driver would use all of those gears leaving the pits, but hold it in top gear around the racetrack. He can also adjust the suspension. This, he can press forward to harden the suspension or stiffen it. If he pulls it back, it goes softer. This is for adjusting when the fuel load is going down. Let's have a look at the pedals. Now, we're looking at this at a different angle. And the right-hand side is the clutch pedal. Now, this would be pressed by the driver's left foot. In the center, of course, is the brake pedal itself, conventional as a street car. And on the right-hand side, or the left-hand side of your screen, would be the accelerator pedal or the throttle pedal. On the outside, of course, there are mirrors for the driver to look back. And a nice little touch in Johnny Rutherford's car. Some racing drivers perhaps won't admit it, but they can be superstitious. A little ladybird here in this, on the steering wheel. That ladybird's been here for two Indy wins for Johnny Rutherford. Perhaps he's wishing for his third. A look inside the race car of Johnny Rutherford. And now Al Unser back in the pits again. He was in just a moment ago. This has got to be trouble this time. Under the yellow, and this could cost him the lead this time. It would seem they're looking underneath the car. He's having his windshield clean. He doesn't often look through that. But they're looking underneath, and there's a USAC official. The man in the white shirt there looking down with a cap and the headset on. He's looking under that car. I'm afraid it may have been that he's been asked to come in by the officials to have inspection. Maybe he dropped something in the pit there the last time, some liquid or something. But we'll find out. Unser on the racetrack again. He's lost the lead. This very special paint is now on sale. It's the paint that can outlast eight years of snow. Jin, and you better believe I give her the treatment. STP oil treatment. Since 1964, over half a billion cans have been sold. No other brand even comes close. So do what millions do. Give your car the treatment from STP. This sweetheart gets a treat. And this sweetheart gets the treatment. There's the way they stand right now at the Indianapolis 500. Same day coverage. Bobby Unser leading. Al has dropped back to third. We'll return with more of the Indianapolis 500 after this from our local station. Back at Indy again, and they're still working on Johnny Rutherford's car. It's been in the pits a long time. This is more like the pit stops you might see in the 24 hours of Le Mans or some other endurance race, but they're going to stay at it. Chris Economaki down in the pits there. I don't know whether you get a John word with Johnny or not. You want to try, Chris? Chris Economaki. Okay, Johnny Rutherford's been sitting here a long time. We're going to try and get a word with him. Thinking about the last 10 minutes. Uh, it's agonizing, Chris. They're, go they're running away from me. What's wrong? Well, we lost all of the teeth off of fourth gear. Okay, Johnny 
Ricky Rutherford agonizing because the competition is running away from him. A word from a man waiting for repairs to be finished. Back to you, Jim. All right, Chris, thanks very much. There's the current leader in the race, Bobby Unser, elder of the racing Unser's from Albuquerque, New Mexico. His brother Al, remember, led for a long time in this race. Looked like he could win easily, almost any way he wanted with the performance of the Jim Hall prepared car. But then suddenly it's began to have problems and has been dropping back. So Bobby Unser leads in the race for the Roger Penske team. And in fact, the Roger Penske team holds second position as well. Quite a remarkable performance for this team to be sitting there one, two at this time. Indeed, an amazing performance. Yes, it certainly is. And in third place is Tom Stephen. Oops, there's smoke coming from Al Unser. Oh, that's bad news. Al Unser smoking. He was in the pits there. They were looking underneath the car. What a disappointment. Jim Hall, a man that I admire. This man gaining from these brothers' misfortune here because Bobby Unser now leading the race really by kind permission of Al because Al really had the race in his pocket. There's a smile on Bobby's face right now, but he must feel some emotion for his brother because they're both very close. Bobby Unser in the blue and white car number 12 of Roger Penske's firmly in the lead. He seems to be controlling the pace a fair bit. Now he seems to be able to pull out. No question of that. The teammates, as you said, running first and second. And by the way, I must might say that before the race, whoops, there's another oh. look at Al Unser. And it's on fire. fire. It's yeah. on fire. Jim Hall sitting in the pits there must be really upset. One of the truly brilliant men. Now, this is a, an oil fire because you can see flame. Remember, these cars burn alcohol. You would not see flame from the alcohol fuel. So it must be oil that's burning there, the smoke and flame. He obviously doesn't know it's on fire. There's no great risk, I hope. But obviously, the officials will be looking at this. They'll be putting out perhaps a black flag to him. This does happen in a racetrack. A driver is his only way of communication. All right, well, the black flag would mean you must go into the pits. It does not mean necessarily you're out of the race, but you mu must go in, be inspected at least, before you go back out again. He does indeed. Alan's are there driving for Jim Hall. As I said, one of the most ingenious men in motor racing, Jim Hall. He's designed cars. He's driven them. He's been team manager. He's been chief mechanic. A man I admire enormously as a, as a constructor of racing cars. He came to Indianapolis for the first time last year, won it. Now was leading this race comfortably. Alan so must be bitterly disappointed. He's pulling off of the racetrack of the main groove now. He obviously looks in his mirror and sees the smoke. And of course, you were talking for a minute there about the car our owner about Jim Hall, he who raced back in the 1960s in those chaparral cars, the first one that had a wing on the back, remember? An adjustable wing, he and Phil Hill drove those two cars. Then later he came in with the vacuum cleaner and this ground effects car, as we said at the beginning, is a successor to that. And I drove the ground effects vehicle, I the remember. vacuum cleaner, on his very first race. He's pulled off the racetrack. We're under the yellow flag. The officials obviously feel that he's been dropping oil, perhaps. They've thrown the yellow flag. Alan just pulled off the raceway just in case he is dropping any oil and he's way down low in the groove there as he's pulling off the track itself what a disappointment the pace car is out and Al Unser is driving into the pits almost certain I'm sure in the knowledge that it's the end of the day well there he is we said there are many more sad stories of the Indianapolis 500 than there are happy ones the only truly happy one the winner of the race at the end and that's very much a question at this point we have past the halfway point, however, and the race is official, but there's no threat of rain. Apparently, they will go all the way. Taking off the cover there, because there's still a lot of smoke. There could still be fire here. The fire extinguisher. Oh, look at Al. He's just shaking his head. He knows. Still hoping for the best, though, staying in the race car with his helmet on, just in case. There's the, uh, the official of the U.S. Auto Club there coming in for the inspection. He's the man would have to remove the threat of the further black flag or removal from the race. Let's go down to Chris Okonomaki for a report. Al Unser is in the pits being checked for an oil leak. A broken pipe was taken out of the rear suspension section of the car. He's led this race all the way. And now they're trying to find out where the oil is leaking from so that they can fix it. But Al is out of the car, and we're going to try and get a word with him here. He comes this way towards our camera. It's a tough break for a new machine shooting for back-to-back -back wins. He won here in 70 and 71, and he won here last year for his third victory. He was going for four victories, which would have tied A.J. Foyt's record. Al stands there, his hands on his shoulders, on his hips rather, rather dejected. 
Dejected is a soft word for it. You heard the applause in the background. Probably that was for him, a very sporting crowd here when any, ever anybody leaves the race. As Chris indicated, he'll try to get a word with Al when we return. Al, you got a second? Have you ever had a bigger disappointment than this one? Chris, in a racing career, you always have uh, disappointments, and this is one of the bad times. It's just it's an awful good race car, and with Penn's oil and the whole group that we have, uh, it's just a shame that we've had problems today because uh, I think I had to handle on it. Well, you really get out. You were flying. You weren't using any rubber. What was it? What was the problem that put you out? Uh, something happened. Uh, an oil leak in the gearbox or something back there. I don't know exactly know what happened, Chris. Were you really pushing the car, Al, or was there more left? Well, you never know unless somebody pushes you, but uh, I was running hard, as hard as uh, that I had to, and, and that's all it takes. What, what flashed through your eyes when you saw that black flag? <laughs> I could look in my mirror and see that I was in trouble, so uh, it's one of those disappointments where you just say, Another day at work. Bad day at work. That's like the ball clubs, Al. There's no he's next year. Better luck next time. So thank you, Chris. Well, and so the race battle as the green flag comes out of brother against brother has ceased here. It's Bobby Unser in the lead, and now it's youth against age because it's Bobby Unser, age 45, against his teammate Rick Mears in second place, age 27. There is A.J. Foyt of the orange car, one lap down, but still a contender. Just behind him, the black car is Danny Ungaius, also moving up in the standings here. A.J. Foyt is in fourth place. Danny Ungaius has now moved up to fifth. In third place at the moment is Tom Sneva, behind Bobby Unser and Rick Mears. And there's A.J. A.J. unlapping himself from Rick Mears. That's a significant move for A.J. Foyt, because remember, if there was a yellow flag to come out again, A.J. would just catch up all of those cars with this new rule here in Indianapolis when the pace car would go out AJ would go all the way around there and then get in behind the pack and that would give him a shot at being on the same lap as the leader. Exactly. If I said Rick Mears I meant of course the leader Bobby Unser. He unlapped himself from the leader. He's now on the same lap with all of the leading cars. Well AJ Foyt a great charge of the crowd stood up and gave him a big cheer there. He's still a popular man. He's a he's a bear. Some days he's sunshine and the other days he can be storms. He's another veteran, but the youthful man we've been watching is Rick Mears, age 27, as we said. Married, father of two little boys, Clint, age six, Cole, age four. In fact, why don't we meet him up close and personal? Rick Mears. If you don't like the sound of engines, stay away from Rick Mears' house in Bakersfield, California. It's not only the 27-year-old driver who won the pole at Indy this year, but his whole family likes to drive things with engines. Dune buggies, motorized tricycles, you name it. White Dina, sons Clint and Cole will give it a try. As for Daddy, well, he's raced off-road and on-road, has even won the race up Pikes Peak. What's the appeal of all this to Rick Mears? I've always been competitive in whatever I've done, racing slot cars or bicycles or whatever it was at any time. I always want to be the first one to get there. I think that's the main thing. The speed, I don't think, has that much uh, to do with it uh, as far as somebody wanting to drive and drive fast. Uh, you only want to go as fast as it takes to, to beat the rest of them. And uh, no matter what speed that is, to get the job done, that's what most people are looking for. I have never been one uh, to go to parties much. I never really felt like I'd fit in. I just, you know, strange people. And uh, I don't know, when you get in a car, you've got uh, crowds of people watching and everything, but you don't realize they're there because you're doing your thing. You're doing it the way you want to do it. Nobody else has anything to do with it. You're all by yourself when you get in that car. When I'm not racing, uh, one of the few things I do is go to the sand dunes with the family with the sand buggies. I enjoy it because it was a fun thing. When I was growing up and living at home, uh, the family would go to the dunes and play with sand buggies over there, which eventually evolved into the race car buggies that we started using later on. And it's a fun thing for my family to do now. It's, a, it's something that we can all participate in together. There's no pressure, it's just a fun thing, and we, we all enjoy it. Racing of some sort was my hobby. The working in between was to make the means so I could go racing as my hobby on the weekends. And uh, I'm just very fortunate uh, there's not too many people that 
can say that they make their living at their hobby, and uh, which is what I'm doing today. And there's just no question in my mind whatsoever uh, if there's any other direction I would rather go. There's not. Rick Mears, a man who doesn't like parties. Well, if he can keep driving the way he is right now in pursuit of his teammate, number 12, Bobby Unser, the leader in the race, there could be a big party in the future of Rick Mears, whether he likes it or not, because he's really moved in on teammate Bobby Unser. Look at this. This is great, really classic Indianapolis racing right now. He's just looking for a place to pass, Bobby. Bobby obviously can't make any error of judgment right now because he's glued right into him. Any move by Bobby Unser out of that groove and Rick Mears would slip underneath him. Of course, I have to recognize that I did choose Rick Mears to win this race, and you chose Bobby Unser. It seems at this moment that it's age and experience against youth and exuberance, and you seem to be leading right now, but there's a long way to go. <laughs> I will say that the issue is still very much in doubt. Bobby the leader, Rick Mears in second place. And remember, on the same lap with them are Tom Steve and A.J. Foyt in third and fourth place. And just behind them is a black car. See that car? That's number 25. Danny Ungayas, he's trying to unlap himself from the leaders to get into contention on the same lap in the race. And then, if there should be one of those yellows under the new rule this year where they close up, then we could have a five-car race going. There is Al Unser, however. Classic sight of a race driver whose luck has run out for this day. We'll be back at Indy. Here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, we've gone 15 laps beyond the halfway point. Average speed of 159 miles an hour. The last time we were with you, there were nine cars out of the race through 48 laps. Since that time, only three more cars are out of the race. The big one, though, Al Unser. Here you saw the top nine, the, the only woman. Actually, she completed only three laps, as the numbers on the right indicate the leader's laps. Going on through the nine, there are 12 out of the race with 23 running. Larry Dixon. With a fuel pump problem, Dick Simon with a broken clutch and Al Unser with one of the tiniest of problems, a transmission seal, one of the less costly of the parts on these expensive race cars. A tough break for the smooth running Al Unser and the Jim Hall Chaparral. Back to Jim McKay. All right, Chris. Thank you very much, Chris. Back on the racetrack now. The leader is still Bobby Unser in car number 12, the red, white, and blue number. A Penske car powered by a Ford British-built Cosworth racing engine. And in fact, the man who designed that very engine is here today, Keith Duckworth, watching his car going well, and he must be a proud man. A lot of these cars are just fueled with his engine. Right now, we also have uh, Danny Ungayas in the picture, remember? He's trying to unlap himself unsuccessfully so far. There is uh, Ungayas, the black car, just behind Rick Mears. He'd like to unlap himself from Mears and then go on to unlap himself from the leader, Bobby Unser. Isn't it amazing that Danny Ungayas hit the wall at 190 miles an hour just really a few days ago in medical terms? And here he is driving a race car right now with the precision and mental clarity that absolutely is necessary. For a while, that was one of the many controversies of this month at Indianapolis as to whether or not he would be allowed to drive before a 10-day waiting period. He was and qualified easily. There is the leader again, once again, remember. Oh, that's uh, Bobby Unser trying to lap right now, A.J. Foyt. Remember, A.J. Foyt is on the same lap with the leaders. But if he is lapped by the leader, it's a different situation when the yellow comes out. And if I were Bobby Unser, I would want to get a lap on a man called A.J. Foyt because if I could take any advantage of him, I would take it because you never know what's going to happen. At the end of a race, A.J. Foyt's always around. He is coming into the pits. A.J. is coming into the pits. Scheduled pit stop for A.J. Foyt. It looks like that. Danny Ungais was coming in there as yes, well. Yes, it is. Right behind him. AJ coming in to have his Texas red and white shirted crew work on his car. Tremendously loyal crew. An amazing man, AJ Foyt. Real contradiction in so many different ways. He has few friends. He's a very private man. And there you see in the top half of our screen, Danny Ungais, who also is a silent man. Hardly speaks to the press at all. Never once. He's really thumping that steering wheel. He's trying to get them to push forward. 12.84 seconds was that stop there for A.J. Foyt. Danny Ungais also getting out onto the racetrack. A quick stop for A.J. The, the boys from Texas being efficient. And the quiet, silent Hawaiian also got a good job from his pit crew. You know, you get used to watching these speeds here. And we must repeat again and again, I think, that the speeds are just under 190 mile an average, mile an average for a lap here. You know, and that includes in traffic sometimes, it's taking the four corners. 
it's amazing these drivers you know you get so used to the speed you get dialed in it's not a question of speed really because the racing driver synchronizes with the elements that he's competing against those elements are the, the actual speed itself the racetrack and the car and he has to get himself into a mood where as he looks down the racetrack it's almost like slow motion like cranking down a film and seeing everything in slow motion he has plenty of time jim even at 190 miles an hour to see his gauges sometimes to relax his wrists a little bit or his neck muscles or just just deep breathe deep breath every now and again on these long 3,000 foot stretches of course, if this goes on uh, for a lot longer, there's still a long way to go, remember. If the situation of teammates battle for the lead goes on, what would be the strategy? Would Roger Penske tell one of them he's supposed to win? I think I know the answer. Well, in Formula One racing, and Grand Prix racing right now, there usually is a standing rule that the man who's leading is allowed to win the race if nothing goes wrong or if they're not challenged by someone else. That's what happened in my team. Of course, different teams have different regulations and there's the in-sign being given to Bobby and so that means that he should come into the pits on the next lap. He knows about it. Sometimes they're in good communication with their headset, two-way radios in these cars to their crew chiefs, but occasionally you have interference and sometimes happens that two of these race cars are on the same wavelength and they do have breakup in the set. So still the old traditional signs are put out. As a matter of fact, you couldn't hear me driving the pace car today, right? Oh, look at this. Tom Sneva in third place in the race. He is coming in very, very slowly for his pit stop. Could he be out of fuel? He could, I think he is out of fuel. And there's the leader coming in. He's coming in at full speed. Nothing wrong with him. He's under power. But it did look as if Tom Sneva had run out of fuel. He really was coasting in there. There you see the man. A great, great crew, of course. And he's not changing any rubber on that car. He's no, no, no problem. And Rick Mears is in the pits at the same time. The first and second place cars, remember. They are teammates, but they're separate pit crews for each car. And there he gets out. There is a time of 13.39 seconds for an answer. He pulls out there, and Rick Mears is the car behind him. But it did look like car number 12, that red and white car driven by Bobby Answer, certainly was able to accelerate away from that pit lane faster. Jim, it's not only the 13 seconds that you stop in the pits. It's the time that you spent coming in and going out. And there is Tom Sneva. He's reached his pit. And looking down from our commentary position here, Jim, I thought that he wasn't going to even make his pit. He was just creeping at the end there. Well, some of his crew members had to run to help push him in. And There's it, a look at Tom Sneed, the former school teacher who sat on the pole twice here, but has yet to win the race. 22.1, that's a long stop for him. The reason for that was that... Once again, we return to Indy, where Bobby Unser is still leading the Indianapolis 500 for 1979. Our exclusive ABC Sports same-day coverage of the Memorial Day weekend classic. The skies overhead are clear. The temperature about 65 degrees now. Ideal racing weather. The crowd estimated at 350,000 gathered here again today. Close racing here as always at Indianapolis. These cars tightly going round there. And these, you see Rick Mears in there and Danny on Guy is behind them. As they're going through there, trying to find their way down this racetrack, A.J. Point there in that orange car, number 14. And these cars coming up to lap, a slower car uh, there, it looks like that's Mosley. It. Uh, that was Mike Mosley, but watch Danny on guys in the black car going down low and unlapping himself from Rick Mears, the second place car in the race. And he really did it in classic style there, going in, he went right underneath Rick Mears, and between these two corners he was able to execute a very professional job. Danny on guys, a very talented driver, 37 years of age, came from drag racing, and there he made a very clean pass on Rick Mears, who of course is in second position. So Danny on guys, although he's fourth, is just unlapping himself from the second man here, but of course he's still got to get up to pass Alan's. Oh, he hit the wall. Oh, Danny, Gaius. Danny on Gaius slammed into the wall, coming out of turn four there. I don't know, and there may be something wrong with that car now because there was flame, he hit the wall solidly. What a fantastic control job, though, to control that car coming off and the wall. And look at this, he's passing another car. Uh. Danny on Gaius is plugged in, and look at the slow motion here. Danny on Gaius, high in turn four, it could be turbulence from the car in front. 
but he hit the wall solidly, quickly got the car back under control again, and then got himself aimed down this front stretch again. But Pancho Carter, he's in trouble. Pancho Carter looks like he's going to be out of the race. Son of Dwayne Carter, a former good driver at Indianapolis. He's a half-brother to Johnny Parsons, who's also in the race. Let's see some of the sights and sounds of Indy. of the mood of Indianapolis. There's the race leader right now still, Bobby Unser. Dave Diles is in the garage area. He has a report for us on Al Unser. Okay, Dave. This is Dave Diles. We're outside the garage of Al Unser, who was leading this race until he dropped out. Al Unser popped off here and said some very strong things before the print media. I've talked with him, and I said, Al, we'd like you to come outside and say those things before the ABC television cameras. He said, look, Dave, I was hot a while ago. I did say some very harsh things. What I said was, a lot of guys who are out there in front are cheating. I said, please come out and say those things before our cameras. He said, no, I was hot then. I'm not going to say it on national television. I said, did you mean what you said? He said, absolutely. What I said was they're cheating. I believe they were cheating. I'm convinced they were cheating. I will not come outside and say it. That's where we stand with Al Unser. Apparently, we don't know the nature specifically of what the charge was, in what way they are cheating on the race course. However, Bobby Unser is the leader, followed by Mears, Foyt, Angaius, and Sneva. Stay with us. Back at Indy again, Bobby Unser is still the leader in the 1979 500-mile race. He's won it twice before, remember, in 1968, 1975. His brother Al, who has won the race three times, led in the early going, but that had to drop out, had oil problems with his engine. Rick Mears is second now, then you saw A.J. Foyt third, Danny Angaius fourth, and Tom Sneva is in fifth position. Sneva, who twice sat on the pole but hasn't won the race. The man in second place hasn't won it either, Rick Mears, but he sat on the pole when it began. There is A.J. Foyta just behind him on Gaius. They are in third and fourth place in the race. And Gaius getting low in the racetrack again, sneaking underneath that other car there. Danny and Gaius seems to have a car that handles well because he can at the last minute duck underneath another vehicle. And right now, he's trying to duck underneath the, the great A.J. Foyt. Both of these drivers, known for the great talent, Danny and Gaius come up very quickly in this form of racing. Although he's not young, he's relatively new to this sport. And over the last few years, he's come in with great surge and is right up with the great names of the sport. Now, somebody said this is kind of like playing chess at 190 miles an hour. A little bit of that going on right now with A.J. Foyt and Danny Angaius dicing in heavy traffic. And, of course, that's always more complicated because not only is it a question of vision, but it's also a question of turbulence, air turbulence. It's tremendous turbulence set up by these cars, sometimes buffeting the car. The aerodynamics nowadays brought into motor racing is a, a highly technical and sophisticated form of engineering. Okay. Danny Angaius right on the rear wheels almost of A.J. Foyt. All of this going on in the Indianapolis 500. You can see the shimmering effect of the rays of the sun and the heat rising from this racetrack. We said that Parnelli Jones is affiliated with A.J. Foyt this year, which surprised a lot of people. Let's go down to the pits to Chris and Parnelli. Jones, the partner in the ownership of A.J. Foyt's car. Foyt has picked up five seconds on the leading Penske cars. 
How hard is A.J. pushing it now, Parnelli? Oh, I don't know. I guess he's uh, hanging in there. Uh, we were trying to get back by Bobby and uh, hope that would uh, help us if a uh, caution flag came out. He's got to pass him and then hope for a yellow flag, right? Right. How much uh, is he taking out of the car? He's really moving. Well, uh, I imagine we're consuming a little more fuel running hard like that, but uh, the traffic uh, fluctuates a little bit out there. I mean, Bobby catches... Uh, some traffic and it slows him down and then uh, AJ catches some so uh, it kind of balances out. How, how many more pit stops will he make do you think? If everything went right we could probably do it on one more stop but uh, I don't know we might be what depending on the caution play. Yeah. Okay there you have it from Parnelli Jones a former great here and winner of the 1963 race. Back to you Jim. Okay straight from the mouth of Rufus Parnell Jones. There you see on the tail of AJ Foyt now Mike Mosley in the Dan Gurney prepared car. He's been running well. He has indeed. The much loved Dan Gurney coming to the speedway. A man who, of course, America loves as a racing driver. Did so well in Grand Prix Motor Racing. Mike Mosley certainly serving him well right now in that white car behind the Coyote Orange car of A.J. Foyt. Another head-on look at them. And into the pits now we have Tom Steva in fifth place in the standings. Let's see. Looking like a problem there. I don't know, it seems to be a rather slow pit stop. Yeah. There's certainly a hold up there. The car number right. one going out of there. It was a certainly slow pit stop, carrying number one because he was the national champion of USAC last year and gets the honor of holding that single digit number. Okay, and now on the racetrack, while we're in the pits there, Denny Angaias did finally slip by A.J. Foyt. So Denny Angaias is now in third place in the race, although on a lap down. Well, Danny and Guys and A.J. Foyt, these are certainly two great runners to be dicing out there. Danny and Guys in the black car coming towards us now, car number 25, wearing his silver helmet, the silent man. Well, that's right. When you look at the ages of all these leaders, Rick Mears' age becomes more remarkable. When you see Bobby Unser, 45, Danny and Gaius, although it's only his third year here, age 37. A.J. Foyt, A.J. Foyt, oh. look, up against the wall. Oh, we've got, we've got that uh, Larry Rice. Rice. He, he Larry didn't Rice. hit it too hard, but he hit it hard enough to do damage. That car's lying there with a bad leg. <laughs> it's got a flat tire. He obviously knocked the wall. You can see the tire mark. The emergency crews, as ever, at Indianapolis coming on. Let's look at it in slow motion. He lost it low in the racetrack. He spun very low down on the racetrack. Turn two, it is, into the fresh part of the racetrack, not being used. And look, there's the contact. Not a heavy contact. I feel... Fairly confident the driver's going to be all right, but for the answer, the yellow is out, so he takes the opportunity of coming into the pits while the yellow light and the yellow flag is being shown. The Penske crew there immediately into action, them wearing these balaclavas over their head. You can see them looking like gangsters there, but it is for protection. All right, they're under the yellow right now. We mentioned earlier that another ABC sports crew has been in the streets of Monte Carlo for the Grand Prix of Monaco today. Right now, we're going to get a special report on that race. Keith Jackson has been there with Sam Posey and Sterling Moss today. So right now, for a report on Monaco, let's go to Keith. This is Keith Jackson reporting via satellite from Monte Carlo with a summary of what happened today in the Grand Prix of Monaco. Thousands of people jamming every viewing site all over this old city. 20 Formula One cars breaking from the start line. The fastest qualifier, pole sitter, Jody Schechter, jumping immediately into the lead. The second fastest qualifier, Gilles Villeneuve, in a Ferrari, like Schechter, gave away second place to Nicky Lauda. But shortly thereafter, had the horsepower and ability to go back and get second place, and the Ferraris ran one, two for a very long time. Nicky Lauda held on to third, but at the Mirabeau turn on the streets of Monte Carlo, this happened. Didier Peroni right up over the top of Nicky Lauda's car. Neither man was hurt. Both cars were damaged, however, out of the race. It appeared Lauda had the line going into the turn. Peroni appeared to break a little too late, and that was the result. It was not a very happy day for the defending world driving champion Mario Andretti. He went out broken suspension quite early in the race. And for a long time, as I said, it was Ferrari 1-2. But in the closing stages, only one Ferrari was there, driven by Jody Schechter. And Schechter was trying to fight off the dogged charge of Clay Regazzoni. And they fought over the final thousand yards just like that. Pale pipe to nose. But the horsepower of Schechter was too much for Regazzoni, and Jody Schechter claimed his second victory at Monaco and his eighth Grand Prix victory in his racing career. Now back to our coverage of the Indy 500. 
So it was, but an old teammate of Jackie Stewart's won the Grand Prix of Monaco. Bobby Unser still leading, and we'll be back. We're in the closing stages of the Indianapolis 500, and look at Bobby Unser in the lead in car number 12. And behind him, car number nine, his teammate, Rick Mears, just battling it out, tooth and nail, almost literally, for the championship uh, of this year of 1979 at Indy. They're teammates, but looks like there's little question they're fighting out. There is Marsha Unser, the wife of Bobby, in the pits, trying to look tranquil. Oh, and Rick Mears really looked like he wanted to get past him there. He got him high. Rick Mears really glued onto the tail. It does seem, however, that Bobby Unser's car is using a little less road than Rick Mears' car. It's amazing, and look at as they come down oh, at the start, catching the ladies head to head. This young man certainly wants to do Woo. the job, but Bobby... I mean, shut him off Bobby, that time. And he's, look at him, he's right high on the racetrack, an error by, an error by Rick Mears. He went too high, he made a big mistake. Bobby Hunter is now going to pull out a big advantage there, and look, he's done it. So 18 more years of racing experience may have something to do with that. Let's go down to Bill Fleming in the pits now with Roger Penske. Roger, the question comes up with Mears and Unser out there, and both of them, of course, on the Penske team. Do they have a free reign? Are they running independently? Definitely, Bill. They're both driving. They both are running to win, and uh, may the best man win. I don't have any favorites. Okay, well, that answers the unspoken question we had here, if there was any instructions to the drivers as to who should win the race if it's just that close. And you heard Roger Penske say it. It's up to the drivers who can win. There's A.J. Foyt in the orange car. And he's a threat because although he's lap, a lap down, if he were to get past these two cars in these closing stages of this motor race, I just wouldn't want A.J. Foyt to be around me because he's got an awful knack of winning the race because he's done it four times already and he desperately wants to do it a fifth. Okay, well, there's the leader, Bobby. Remember that A.J. would have to get past not only Mears but also Bobby to get on the same la lap as the leader right now. Whoop! Bobby Unser slowing down, the race leader. Oh, Something's wrong. He's pulled off the racetrack, and he's pulled right off the racetrack. Bobby Unser. Oh, shocker. This is, and he hasn't gone into the pits, but look at him in small motion here. He was high in the groove, and suddenly he realized something was wrong. He immediately held himself down. Rick Mears there, the blue and white car there in the center, and A.J. Foyt get past him. He must have thought there was something serious there because he pulled right off the racetrack. It's on turn four, and he then pulled as if he was going into the pits, but Couldn't in fact, have happened, happened more suddenly or dramatically. Bobby Unser is not going to win this race, but look at A.J. Foyt. He's trying to unlap himself from Rick Mears, who is now the race leader. Foyt has got Mack on the same lap. In other words, if the yellow comes out, he could have a chance still of winning this motor race. Oh, my goodness. Rick Mears, 27 years of age, very young, and he's going to be faced with this man. And here, look at him slow motion as he goes past the start finishing line there. He comes up alongside Rick Mears. He's gaining as he goes towards turn one. He has the ideal line. He can crowd Rick Mears out. Rick Mears has to lift off because there's no room for two cars in turn one. Rick Mears, still the leader of this race. Amazing young man. I don't think in the history of my memory in motor racing, I can think of a 27-year-old who's as mature as a racing driver, Jim. He thinks so cleanly, so astutely. And here, he, he pulls into the pits. He's coming into the pits. Is this his last pit stop? It must be his yes. last pit stop. Rick Mears, enormously important now. He can't go too fast into this pit. If he overshoots it, he could lose the entire 500-mile race right here. No emergency here, it appears, however. His teammate, Bobby Unser, came in very much in trouble, but this looks like the last regularly scheduled pit stop. There you see the clock running on the pit stop as to its length. They've had very good ones all day long. This has to be the final good one. 13-2. And no change of rubber. It's just fuel for him. Now, remember, E.J. Foyt's still on the racetrack and still trying to catch him up. Amazing. This And there's Bobby Unser coming into the pits. He's finally come in. He nearly came in the previous lap. Bobby Answers come into the pits. He's getting his fuel. He intends to go back out. It's not a terminal problem in AJ Foyt. He comes into now. He's in second place on the same lap as Rick Mears. Bobby Answers still in the pits, being talked to. They're and he's going out. 
he's okay. He's going out. He's okay, but he's been going very much slower and has dropped way back. He's not going to win the race, no question of that. He's but A.J. Foyt, as we say, if something dramatic in the way of a yellow happened here, could have a chance. Now, there's his pit stop. Eight and a half seconds. Oh, boy, Woo. the Texans, the big, strong Texans have been certainly doing that. A.J. Foyt getting a big cheer from the crowd. But here's this young man going out there. He's got 39 seconds, his pit crew tells him. Advantage on A.J. Foyt. And there's a car. Uh, Tom, it's Tom Sneva. Tom Sneva. He's nice a... set on the pole here. Was doing very well for a while this afternoon. Has pushed it into the wall. Appears to be all right, as you can see. He's getting under the car, out of the car by his own power. Lost a wheel there. It was Tom Q when he had his big accident back in 1975. And it's Tom Q again. He's okay. He's dazed. He chossed off his steering wheel there. He's all right. But the yellow is out. Could A.J. Foyt have a chance? He's 39 seconds behind, but they will be closing up. But he still will have many cars, in all probability, between him and the leader. The issue, however, still in doubt, as it almost always is, near the end of Indy. We'll be back. We're still under the yellow flag in Indianapolis. For a while, it looked like they might have to finish this race under the yellow, meaning nobody could change positions. But right now, they have been getting that debris off the track. The race car of Tom Sneva has been removed and a bit of uh, scrubbing going on out there. They're warming up the tires because yep. the yellow flag being out slowed the pace down to about 80 miles an hour, and now they're getting their tires warm. And AJ's right at the back. He can't get up any further because the rules don't allow him, but he's still in second place, remember, and he's always a threat. The problem of Bobby Unser, we hear some problem. We've got a message from the pits, Jim, on that. Yeah, well, uh, we understand that he told Roger Penske on the radio that he had lost, lost a gear, I believe. And, uh, or was stuck in gear. I think he was stuck in third. Well, if that's the case, he said... Oh, excuse me, the green flag is out. Racing again. Now, A.J. Foyt's only chance, it appears. You see how far back he is. Way at the top of your screen. Just out of your picture right now. That's how far... There he is. The orange car, way behind. However, should the slightest thing happen to Rick Mears' car, it still could happen. There are four laps to go. Less than four. A.J.'s passed one car already, but he's not passing them as quickly as I expected. I expect usually A.J. Foyt to anticipate the flag, and he hasn't done it. I don't know. A.J.'s not just charging as well as he should do, but certainly Rick Mears now has to drive conservatively, but his pit will be telling him everything about what's happening. The time has come for the 27-year-old to maintain that cool that you spoke of, that he has to a remarkable extent for his age. It is an amazing thing. He's a very cool man. He came up to me just minutes before the start while I was standing beside the Mustang pace car, and he just wanted to thank me for everything we had done during the month of May. The presence of mind that this young man has even minutes before the start of this, this most important race of his career was to me impressive. Less than three laps to go. He's got nobody in front of him. He has nobody close behind him. And A.J. Foyt is not making the charge that I anticipated. This is surprising to me. When he passed the, the commentary position here on this last lap, I thought I heard A.J.'s engine not performing the way it should. It sounded almost like he was in seven cylinders, and if that's the case, uh, it's he all can't over. make it. Yeah. But, so, you know, to think of this man, to think that Rick Mears said that he sort of lacked confidence and he was shy and so forth. It seems so strange and contradictory to a man who controls the pace of a racing car, all that power and energy below him with such positiveness. It is a contradiction, as is so often the case with racing drivers. No question about that. The center of attention of 350,000 people, but he doesn't like parties. As he said earlier, it looks more and more like he's going to have to attend one tonight. Two laps to go. You know, very tiring, Jim. A racing driver can get very tired. The G-forces in his head. He has helped to assist that. But still, after 500 miles, there's a lot of fatigue, particularly mental. That's Mike Mosley just behind him. Mike Mosley, who's running fifth in the race at the moment. Not a, not a threat at all to him. Just running behind the leader there, as it happens, at this point. Well... <laughs> Rick Mears has to be counting the miles now until he gets to the end of this race. He knows that AJ's on the same lap. He knows that he can't make an error. He's got to stay out of trouble, but he must be praying now. He must be imagining all the nasty things that could happen and think of the thousands of things that can happen, even though the white flag has been shown by Pat Vidan. There's thousands of moving parts in there, any one of them. Oh, nickels and dimes would buy them that could let him down. Unofficially, we've had our 
Demon statistician Jay Milligan checking through the record books. It looks like he would be the second youngest winner ever of the Indianapolis 500, the youngest having been Troy Rutman. And there's Mike Mosley. Well, he's having a little fun unlapping himself there. Well. Troy Rutman. And there's Mike Mosley. Well, he's having a little fun unlapping himself there. Well, he didn't go very deep there. Rick Mears back right off and let yep. him through there because obviously Rick couldn't risk coming in contact with him or getting out of line because mental concentration could get the better of him at this time. Incidentally, AJ's going much, much slower, dropping way back at this point. Looks like he does have a problem. And here comes the checkered flag awaiting young Rick Mears at age 27. He has won the Indianapolis 500 for 1979. There is Roger Penske, the man who owns the crew, and the rest of the guys of the Penske operation. The celebration has already begun. There is Rick. It's unofficial and will stay unofficial until tomorrow morning, technically here, but they know it's all over. There's Penske again. His last winner uh, was the late Mark Donahue in 1971, but look at A.J. Foyt. He's, he's, he, he's creeping, Jim. He's in big trouble. It looks like he's even coasting by there. He's, he switched off his engine. There's no sound, John. Outside, there's no sound of A.J. Foyt's engine. He's crossed, he's waving, he recognizes, he's second, it's not gonna be a fifth, but I think he's just glad that he's Look, crossed that line the, of the road. The yard of brick that marks the finish line here at the racetrack that's called the Brickyard, the checkered flag again, and somehow or other, A.J. always ends up as the center of attention when he finishes the race. He's lifting his hand, he's saying, I don't know, but it's all over, he switched his engine off, but he's just a happy man to finish second right now, I'm sure. All right, but again the winner, Rick Fears of Bakersfield, California, in the Penske Cosworth car number nine. Sat on the pole with a qualifying speed of more than 193 miles per hour, bided his time, drove a very cool, heady, and intelligent race. And there's AJ, he went to the end of the pits, and now they're going to have to push him back into his pits, his faithful checkered shirt crew. And there's Rick, the hand in the air. You can only imagine what he feels in the stomach. A happy man, but an unhappy Bobby Unser. And there, of course, is Danny and Guys. He finished up with a great move he did all the way through the field from so far back. Past Bobby Unser, in fact, after the green flag came out on the last couple of laps. Rick Mayer's the winner then, unofficially, coming into victory lane. The milk will be waiting for it. The tradition here has always been milk rather than champagne, and it will be again. We'll be back for the celebration at Indy. Well, here's how they finish. Rick Mears, the winner, unofficially. A.J. Foyt, second. Danny Ungaius, third. Bobby Unser, who led much of the way, fourth. And Mike Mosley in the Dan Gurney car was fifth in the Indianapolis 500. The celebration going on down in Victory Lane. Let's go down and join it now. All right, Chris. Congratulations. A great two years at the Speedway. Front row both years. Pole this year. What did you think when you saw Bobby commit to the pits and then blow it? Well, I hated to see it, but uh, I like to see it, too. And I just I couldn't believe it. it uh, I just figured it couldn't happen, you know, it's just unbelievable. Rick, your face is clean, everybody around you is shaking, you rock steady. What are you thinking of right now? I don't know what to think, really. It's just, I can't even imagine what this is. I really can't. I'm just, I've got to wait and give it time to soak in, I think. Now, when you went motorcycle riding and you had a conversation with Roger Penske just two and a half short years ago, did you ever think it would lead to this? Well, I sure didn't, but I'm sure glad it did. I want to thank him very much. How about the race itself? Any uh, problems, any thrills? What about that one high ride? Well, uh, we did get a little high once or twice, and uh, we got a little situation where we were a little loose at one point, and uh, the car was trying to loop on me pretty good. But once we got that sorted, the thing went very smooth. We just tried to run consistent, and the guys did a hell of a job for me in the pits, getting me in and out of the pits quick, and uh, I just want to thank all of them for doing a super job. Well, okay, thanks for a great race. Congratulations and good luck to you, Rick Mears. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. 63rd winner of the Indianapolis 500, a two-year man, Rick Mears. I got you. And so, only the tenth time in 63 runnings of the Indianapolis 500 as a pole sitter won the race. Only two drivers went the entire 200 laps, Rick Mears and A.J. Foyt, who finished second. The last pole sitter to win here at Indianapolis was Johnny Rutherford in 1976. We've got to uh, pat on the back the only rookie in the race who finished seventh. He's a 29-year-old native of Ann Arbor, Michigan, Howdy Holmes. He finished seventh completing 195 laps. He's a former Formula 3 racer, and we'll hear more from him. And also to Bill Vukovic, who was only one of the two drivers in the extra day of qualifying yesterday to make the field, and he finished eighth. Now we're going to show you the unofficial results of 35 placings. The race will not be official until 8.30 tomorrow morning. 35 drivers this year. Take a look at how perhaps your favorite finished in the race. The total purse should approximately 
somewhere around one and a quarter million dollars, which would mean that first place to Rick Mears and his crew would mean $300,000. Or second place would do A.J. Foyt and his crew $135, and third $100,000. Last year, the 33rd finisher, Cliff Husel, received $15,000. In lap prize money today, Bobby Unser leading 89 laps, 17,800. Al Hunter, who led 85 laps, 17,000. Rick Mears, 25 lap leader at $5,000. And A.J. Foyt, who finished second, led the race only one lap, earning $200 in that category. Clean, safe race as we go back to Jim McKay. Okay, Chris, and our thanks to you. Right now, you're looking at a live shot. It is coming up on 10 o'clock at night at Indianapolis. The pole is still alight. There you see it. It's been quite a day. One other thing I think is interesting, Jackie, is that of the 35 starters, 17 finished, and that's the most cars to have finished, we are told unofficially, since 1960, 19 years ago. There were aged men in this sport, experienced men who tried and who led. 39-year-old Al Unser, 45-year-old Bobby Unser, 44-year-old uh, A.J. Foyt. But on this day, youth was served. 27-year-old Rick Mears was the winner.